Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor Maria Burton and artist Koji Takai. Actor-director Maria Bor Burton, I don't know why I'm saying this wrong, uh, Maria Burton was graduated from Yale University, but after being raised in Buffalo, New York, and when she went to Yale, she got a degree in theater and film. She directed plays, she made short films, and tell us about this one thing that you did called the Litany of the Clothes. Oh, um, my mother uh, wrote a novel called Heartbreak Hotel, and there are many litanies in the novel. It's, a, it's an unusual format for a novel. And we took one of them, the Litany of the Clothes, and turned it into a play. And I mm -hmm. had originally developed that for my senior thesis project at Yale. Oh. And then we took it on um, and, and performed it for the Harvard uh, Summer Theater. They At the Loeb Theater. Yes. Which is great. I love that theater. Yes. It's, it's fabulous. But a litany of the clothes was chosen, actually, at yes. Yale. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, here's it was a, Maria Burton just putting her, her play on. It was a great honor. It was. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, and to have the that. Yale uh, main stage in the dramat <clears throat> was just, it, it was it was wonderful for me as a as a director, and then also for my mom as the writer. And you won the, the uh, beginning of our collaboration as a family on it? material. I I, I I mean certainly the first time I directed something my mom had written. Oh, but um, you won a first prize in playwriting. And a playwriting contest. Was that for something else? It was for the same play. Then it was at the uh, Ujima Theater Company in Buffalo, New York. Oh, and so that was different, too. So well, it played a lot. It did, exactly. It, the, because people would see it and hear about how well it had done, and then they'd invite it to be done somewhere else, which is also fun as a director because each time you have the opportunity to revise. What does it say, the litany of the clothes? What is it actually? Well, uh, litanies are sort of lists in, in a somewhat poetry form. I think it's really from um, oh. <laughs> a religious kind of uh, the way that they do things. I, I believe it's in the Bible that the things are listed as litanies. So what Mom's done in the novel is taken it into a um, everyday context. And the litany of the clothes, <laughs> it's all these memories of different um, well, different clothes that she had and the stories behind them. You remember the red dress that you wore to the prom. Yeah, that's what I wondered. The, is that how it is? A list of things like that? Right. And, and so for the play, in it? exactly. We took it oh. and expanded it. So we had, I think, 12 women and every woman played a part and they're sort of icons of the uh, of, of a, a feminine experience. Oh, I like that. And yeah, it was beautiful. And, <laughs> like and then what we could do is have I had a lot of um, multimedia, and the first one with slides, I'd taken pictures out of magazines and the thematic to the thing, and then songs that were thematic. So to it the was experience. different periods, exactly. With the different periods of clothing, exactly. Oh, it sounds great. I love it. But then how it all becomes so personal. <laughs> you, you remember that uh, the the thing you were wearing when you were proposed. To to, right. You know, got engaged right. and things right. like that. So. Oh, it sounds really good. It I thought was. that was fun to. to it was work a long on. time ago than now, though. So you're <laughs> the, dragging about, my memory. <laughs> what about the costume designer? Uh, or did you use your mother's clothes? I, I think I pretty much uh, worked on that because I had been so involved and oh. aware of the um, the the piece from the novel that that was very much a part of developing it as a theater piece. Well, bringing you more, you're talking that was so long ago, bringing you more up to date, uh, My Name is Alice, you directed it. That was a show that, that Ursula and I had produced here in Los Angeles. Ursula is your sister. Ursula is my sister. I work with my sisters. Um, there are five of us now in our film company, Five Sisters Productions. 
but the and Genesis. Really sisters. Yes, we really are sisters. <laughs> and uh, the the first two working together were uh, I was working with Ursula on Alice on a My Name Is Alice. It's a um, musical review with five women, and we were two of the actors. And also, well, you acted in it. Mm -hmm. Do you sing? Yes, yes. They were singing and dancing. It's a musical review, so it was. Uh, we had amazing actors involved. Two who'd been on Broadway and is that right? Musicals, yes. And they ended up running about a year here in Los Angeles. Well, how did you know how to direct something like this? Oh, had I had uh, majored in directing at uh, oh. Yale, and so I, I had directed both theater and film. And oh, so you were. And, and frankly, I'd been doing it since I was a kid, getting my sisters together and let's put on a show in the backyard and invite the neighborhood. And were you the pushy sister who got them all together? Well, I'm the oldest sister, oh, so you are? in that sense, uh, I think sometimes the ringleader. What's the age span? Eight years for five of oh, us. Oh, wow. I can't and imagine no twins. my mom. No. <laughs> no twins. It's amazing. <laughs> After My Name is Alice, you did a, a movie, Just Friends? Yes. Or? Just Friends was the first movie I directed. It's a romantic comedy. And it uh, had a cable, a wonderful cable premiere on AMC. Their offshoot at the time was Romance Classics, which is now the WE channel, and it's still running on there. Oh, so, so now it's still running, and people are saying it the other day when I was with you, someone came up and said, were you, uh, is that yours, Just Friends? Because we've seen it on cable. Yes, it, it's, it's so been it lucky for us because it runs a lot and around the world, and people are always calling up and saying they've seen it. And when it started running, we knew every time exactly that it ran. And, and now then, you're just... Yeah, it's just just nice to hear when people tell us. <laughs> was that a big budget film? No, uh, my first two films were under a million dollars. Oh, and they were. Yes, uh, we definitely. It was wonderful because it looked a lot bigger budget than the budget we had because I had sponsorship from Kodak, oh. Kodak and uh, Deluxe and Panavision. So they help you with the film, with the footage. I mean, with the um, well, stock, it was my less? first uh, uh, film that I had directed and they, if they have directors that they believe will go on, they want to oh. start a relationship so you'll work with them in the future, How which great. has worked. Well, we have gone back. That's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Now that we have though, bigger budgets. Yes. To invest in right. up and coming people. Exactly. And Bud Stone, who was the head of Deluxe, he was just my guardian angel and, and I'd asked to, for them to help me out in certain ways and not only did he get Deluxe to help me out but then he uh, let Kodak and Panavision know so they helped out too. And so who produced those? You? As well? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yes, and, and Ursula was out here working with me and Gabrielle, my fourth sister, had just finished film school in France. So she came out to work as a producer on the film. And then, it was so much work, we ended up roping in uh, the other two sisters, Jennifer and Charity, at the end of the process. And uh, they, they were so great. They were having other careers at the time. Jen was back at Harvard for a, a PhD in literature. And Charity was working with AmeriCorps, uh, oh, doing yeah. teaching literacy for underprivileged uh, adults. And, and children, and then uh, we had such a good time working together that we agreed to all do the second film together, Temps. And my sister Gabrielle wrote that. Uh, what is Temps? I don't know anything about that. Temps is an ensemble comedy, slice of life about the other sides of Generation X and Y. It's oh. uh, very, it, it, we'd seen all these slacker kind of movies and, and felt that Everyone we knew, including ourselves, we worked really hard. It wasn't just a total representation of the generation. Oh, so we, exactly about people, and and also the whole reconciliation between um, when you are taught you can be anything that you want to be, and then you get to a point in life and you say, "Is this it?" Am I? Because you sort of Have I done it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then you get to the next point in life, which is Manna from Heaven, which is the your latest creation, yes. and it's showing in theaters everywhere, and it's uh, a bigger budget. Yes, yes, much bigger budget than the first two. Not so big, though, for an independent. Not so big. For, I mean, yes, it's about $4 million, and uh, we've uh, been adding to it all the time it seems with the with the release uh, the release itself is so expensive it's interesting that's a real challenge for a low budget independent movie and you're the director but mm -hmm. are the produ are your producer sisters working on that release and oh, all we're the all public working relations on it. in fact this one i co-directed with my sister gabrielle uh. and we 
uh, all five produced, and my mother wrote it, as oh, I say. Did. So the, the back at the Litany of the Clothes was the first time, oh, and now here again great. directing something that she wrote. And my father retired. He was a professor of psychology at SUNY at Buffalo and retired and now is working with the release as well. We have a short clip mm -hmm. on Manna from Heaven. And then we'll talk about all these fabulous actors you have and the film festivals it went to and all the awards it won. So let's see that clip, please. What happens when a gift from God turns out to be a loan? Give the money back. Starring Ursula Burton, Academy Award nominee Seymour Cassell, Shelley Duvall, Jill Eikenberry, Academy Award winner Louise Fletcher, Frank Gorshin, Faye Grant, Tony Award nominee Harry Groner, Academy Award winner Shirley Jones, Academy Award winner Cloris Leachman, Wendy Malick, and Austin Pendleton. Manna from Heaven. Well, what an array of actors. Where did you get them? And they're all either Academy Award winners, nomina nominated for Academy Awards. I mean, the Emmys, people yes. you could never think of getting in a movie. Well, some of them we had, Seymour Cassell, uh, he was in our second film, Temps, so we already oh, knew yeah. him and we're friends <laughs> with him. Uh, Shelley Duvall had seen Temps at a film festival and she stood up after seeing it, she said, oh, hi, I'm Shelley Duvall and I love this movie. I think you're very talented filmmakers and I would like to work with you on anything you do in the future. She's so, so of course, great. we loved her for that. <laughs> we love her. And, and uh, <laughs> became friends and then asked her to do this film. And then uh, the other ones, the script is just such a wonderful script, wonderful characters. I think when they read it, they really wanted to be a part of it. But Frank Gorshin plays a big part. Yes. And he's doing an off-Broadway. or Broadway, was, on Broadway. Is it on yes, Broadway? Yes, Gracie, absolutely. The, the, was um, he doing it while you, were, while you were doing no, this? No, oh, we, we finished shooting a couple years ago. Oh, you did? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now. So it takes a long time, doesn't it? Especially when you're low budget and, and everything and grass takes roots. longer. Right. So what does grassroots mean? You go to every film festival and you get, whatever film festivals you went to, you got awards. It seems that way. <laughs> we won many audience awards and that was part of the reason we decided to take it out uh, theatrically in this way of giving it time uh. to grow the word of mouth. Many movies, the way they're released now, it's all about the opening weekend and we felt that we, yeah. if, if we did it that way, it just would be over in a couple of weeks, and that's what happens to smaller films. Then they often it's just they have their life on video and TV, and we wanted this to have its opportunity and theatrically. Have any of these actors, like Cloris Leachman or who else do we see up here? Harry Gorner, has have any of them been out with you? At oh screening? yes, have and it's they? been so nice for us because during the filming of the movie because so many of them are also singers, they would go out at night and sing in the restaurants in <laughs> Buffalo and we'd hear the next day what great time they had and they'd say, you have to come out with us tonight. And we were all working so hard, we'd say, we wish, but you know, it won't happen now. So in the release, it's been very nice that we've had time to actually spend with them when they've come to either the festivals or the openings of the film. And you, and you shot at Buffalo, it was familiar territory. You, your family was raised there. Your yes. father taught at the university. And so you must have had a friendly atmosphere. Oh, the city was wonderful. It's a story of community coming together and rebuilding itself. And it was interesting how the city of Buffalo really came together to make did this they, movie happen. Did they feel, did they have any healing to do? Or were, oh, I mean, that's an interesting question. To, I, I think it wasn't a question of healing, but they were just very happy to have the city shown Recognized, in all its beauty maybe. because so often Buffalo all people know about it is the snow or and, the Niagara uh, Falls right but, I mean think right. about that but but many people it's also come on hard times it was a premier city a hundred years ago and all these architects wanted to build there I know Frank Lloyd Wright exactly. has several houses there I exactly know. Frank Lloyd Wright Louis Sullivan oh, and Louis we wanted to showcase all those buildings in the movie so a lot of them are in the opening credits but then even within the film like the mayor's offices and city hall we've put that in the movie and we didn't even know about that until we were meeting with the mayor to talk about the film and then so you wrote that in at the time 
time and the theater that you refurbished. Shays. And that almost was torn down to build a parking lot and there was a big protest in the city to keep it and so now it's this vibrant theater and we used it in the story. It starts out run down and then is built up but of course for us we were lucky that it already had been built yes. up because it's much easier to dress something down <laughs> yeah. than to have done that renovation. So there's so many interesting things. There's so many other aspects than the feel good movie, mm -hmm. which is a feel-good movie. And also because of the idea of community coming together, we have elected to uh, team with Habitat for Humanity. And in oh. each of the cities we go to, we donate the uh, our portion of the proceeds to Habitat for the opening night. That is so fabulous. So everyone, we all have to see it. I'll go see it again. Manna from Heaven and Maria Burton, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So happy you were here. And I'm so happy you watched Maria, but don't go away because we'll be right back with Koji Takei. And this is Koji's artwork on the set, and he's going to tell us about it. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back. We're with artist Koji Takei, who was born and raised in Tokyo. He came to California to continue his education and has never left. Why would he? With a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Cal Institute, California Institute of the Arts, then he pursued <coughs> uh, his professional career in graphic design, and during the 80s, he won lots of awards, and Koji, tell us what a graphic designer does. Graphic designers um, basically design things that gets printed. Some, well, part of the uh, work is to do web design, but mostly we design things that gets printed. Like, to, to like to who would come to you? A, cl a company uh, who needs trademarks, business cards, uh, stationary systems. Uh, sometimes I work for ad agencies, sometimes I, I work for record companies, uh, anything uh, that's uh, commercial. commercial and graphic. What happens when you come out of CalArts um, and you're a graphic designer? Uh, somebody say, hello Koji, I need you to work. What do you do? Uh, usually when you graduate from college, it doesn't work that way. It, uh, I went to work for a a graphic design firm as a designer and I, I, I stayed there for about four week, uh, four years and you know built up my uh, uh, training actually. I see. And, and at a firm like that you'd get corporate uh, people coming in. Yes, definitely. Because and, it's and a big firm. And absolutely. The firm that I worked for b mostly design annual reports and we oh. did corporate identities which are a big name for trademarks and, and logos so uh, my basic training was uh, done there and it was very structured. But I remember seeing those um, annual reports they were always so boring where now they're peppier. There always ha have been annual reports that are designed by designers. Uh -huh. If the company's doing well, it's a marketing tool to show their stockholders how well uh, the company's doing. So they put good, a lot of, exactly. How good it looks and mm -hmm. the, e even the graphic part of it. Exactly. And they, they put a lot of money into designing and printing those things. Is that a, a more of a current trend or has it been? No, it's always been that has way. It? Yes, yes. But, but, but actually the current trend, believe it or not, because of the economy, has been to uh, pull back oh, and to not, not even spend so much money. Really? In the so 80s and the 90s were, I think, the, they spent the most money. But they spend money on the design aspect of it, is yes. that what we're saying? Yes, and printing. And the paper and the printing. Printing, and mm -hmm. printing is the, the biggest part oh, of, of the budget. Why, because it's the paper or because of the colorways? Because or public companies have to mail these uh, annual reports to all stockholders and sometimes they mail out uh, 500,000 copies, I 1 see. million copies. Oh, the That's printing why. part, the, the uh, amount of printing, mm -hmm. not that it costs so much to print one book or exactly. something like that. I exactly. see, I see. Yeah, exactly. Well, once you were with a big company, then to really prove you had the graphic talent, 
You started your own company. Yes, I did. <laughs> what did we call it? Uh, it was called Gormley Take Incorporated. It was a design and marketing company. I started with my partner, businessman, and I was the designer. And I did it because I was always told, and I believe that to be a successful designer, you have you have to have your own company. And so, so I because it has say your name then is identified with that company. Yes. Your designs are identified. Your yes. creativeness. Yes, but I had designers working for me, and we grew. Uh, this was between ninety six. I'm sorry, eighty six and ninety one. Did that for about five or six years, and I had designers working for me. I had about seven or eight staff, and I started going out meeting clients showing mm. designs uh, that sometimes was not even my own because I would have my staff do it. So but that became a real business venture. It sure was. It sure did. And I, that's what, towards the end of uh, that process, I started not liking it because mm. it was mostly <laughs> business and very little bit of design. And I found that out the hard way, basically. But, but a creative person getting into something like that and then ending up having to have designers do the work, even mm -hmm. though you were on top of it and choosing the designs and, and choosing the people to do it, mm -hmm. just doesn't have the same happiness involved it, with it. It really wasn't. And, and it was very hard. It was, especially the early 90s, it was very hard financially. Oh. And we were, you know, we were sort of getting by, and I had, the, the overhead was, was oh, huge. Oh, because it was so big. Yes, yeah. yes. So I really didn't enjoy it. So you pulled back yourself and decided to change from graphic design to it, fine arts. Exactly. And well, how did that happen? Did well, you go cold turkey into fine arts? Uh, Pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> it's something that I always wanted to do. When I was a little boy, I told myself I'm going to be an artist. And I don't know where I sidetracked, but I got into being a graphic designer. But I don't think that's sidetracking. I think graphic design is so creative. I yes. mean, you're an artist in your own field. Yes. But, but this is totally different. You're alone. Exactly. You're on the line. I, I, exactly. And it is, to me, since I've been on both worlds, there is a huge difference between design or commercial art, per se, uh, right. versus fine art. Right. And so when you got in the studio, did you know what kind of media you were going to use? Did you, were you going to be a sculptor? No, I had no idea. I, I went ahead and rented a, I took a two-year hiatus uh -huh. uh, after my company, and I released a studio in Marina del Rey, and I sat in my studio, I went, here I am, <laughs> what am I going to do now? <laughs> I was lost, and it's mainly because I was so used to be having projects and jobs given to me. And telling you what to do. Telling me what to do and Koji and here's the deadline. Yeah. Uh, you have to finish this by July 13th. And here I am, I was sitting all by myself and there was no project. And no gallery and no, no show to no work show for. No show to work for <laughs> and no, no clients. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. So I think that was the hardest thing I faced. And, and th th what I did was I started going out to museums and galleries and I started reading books, and which was basically a market research. I know, but it, it's interesting the way you approached it as a market research. But in school, you must have known those artists, and you must have come across them. Not really, because oh. I was all into design. Oh. I, I, I had no idea. Oh, so this really was background work. Yes. In a, I mean, yes. for you, really which quick. is interesting. That's, yes. that's interesting that you would approach it from a marketing point. We've got to get all the information we can. Exactly, in a very sh short time. And I, what happened was I kept, after seeing a lot of people's work, I kept coming back to one artist's work again and again, and I saw influence of this artist's work and so many p uh, people's work and that was Picasso. And this is this is like uh, Picasso from the... I still have I mean, the influence like of it, that but, cubist. But the cubist yes. influence. Yes, And it, it could be a Brock, it could be a, any yes. other cubist. Uh, yes. 
It's a, it's a strong influence. Uh, but you used uh, found objects. This is a found yes, object. There, it is. This which piece, is what? This piece is uh, made of uh, basically a pizza pan <laughs> that, that my gallery owner, Robert Berman, and his wife Lisa found uh, oh. at, the, at a flea market. Oh. So sh they brought, brought this pizza pan and also a found violin, and I, I basically transformed them into a, a one piece. I'm going to just show, I'm going to hold this up because I think it's easier um, to is that, see is this. That better? Yeah, and you can tell us. This piece is called Measure of Success, and it's made of also a found object. And it is about the fish that got away, the elusive success. And it got bigger and bigger. It got bigger and bigger, <laughs> but the success is all subjective. And it's only by measure, can be measured by you. Hold this one, too. Okay. We've stretched this $100 bill yes. really Actually, to this camera. This one over here. Oops, oh, sorry. <coughs> Actually, uh, this is um, called staying afloat, and it's, it describes my state of uh, <laughs> life right now. And it's made out of, I wanted to use a $100 bill oh. to make this. But just before I was going to cut the $100 bill, I said, no, I'm going to use a $10 bill. I see that. Yeah, I so see. <laughs> it's made out of $10 bills. And it's, again, about stretching the dollar. I love it. Mm. It's got this stretch. Yes. And then one other thing, I just want to make sure before we, we um, this is about today. Uh -huh. so show this is this. about making, it's called making adjustments, and it's about relationships, how you have to make adjustments constantly. But they're uh, leaves. They're leaves. They're actual eucalyptus leaves with the acrylic, acrylic paint on it, and they're bound together, most of them. And so each one has a different relationship exactly. to each other, and right? making adjustments constantly. Ah. <laughs> I think it's like it's it's so interesting because you have to really hear what the work is about, and then you've shown all over California. You've got shows all over California, and it looks like you've found your forte as I think an so. artist. I think so for now. Mm -hmm. And. Um, Robert Berman sh in uh, Bergamot Station Cur shows your work. Currently, I have a show up at the Bergamot Station. It's open till April 19th. But you also teach at Otis. Yes. Believe it or not, I teach design, not fine art. Oh, that's great. <laughs> We're going to finish with that. Yes. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. And right. thank you for being with us on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. 917. See you next time.